Well, good morning. It's good to see you back this morning. Hope that you rested well. We want to begin our session this morning. We'll uh, sing for a little bit, and then Sam Waldron will be back with us, um, giving us his uh, third and final uh, talk. I think this morning uh, is on some lessons from Calvin for him as a Baptist pastor. So looking forward to that. A um, um, couple of resources I want to mention to you. Um, Jim, Jim Earhart has uh, arrived this morning and he has, uh, most many of you who are, maybe are familiar with his ministry, teaching resources. If you're not, then there's actually a sign-up sheet uh, on, the, on a table out there that he'd be glad to mail you uh, his, his resources. Um, but this particular edition, it's fresh off the press, is um, uh, concerning John Calvin. And so I would encourage you to get this particular edition and encourage you to subscribe to it as, as well. And so uh, that's out there on the back table. His resources are available to you for free. And, and then, um, although we haven't literally used it uh, in our conference, we sang some songs out of it, but um, some of you asked about the Founders Hymn Book, uh, and it is in the book room as of this morning. Then let's sing to the Lord, uh, and then Sam will come back uh, once again. Father, as we gather on this morning, we are grateful for the new mercies that you have extended to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you for the gift of rest. We thank you for this new day. We acknowledge, Father, that while we slept, you, you did not sleep. You, you were working on behalf of your people. And thank you that we could rest in that. And Father, as we gather here this morning, we, we are grateful to be here with friends and brothers, and, and we ask that you would now help us as we sing, that we would sing as unto you, that we would even be used by you to encourage each other by how we sing. We do pray for our brother Sam this morning, that you would enable him and strengthen him as he stands before us once again, as he teaches us some more about John Calvin. Father, we are grateful, first of all, for your faithfulness, and we are grateful for the evidences of grace that we see in Calvin's life. And so, Father, may your name be exalted, for we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it's a delight to be here this morning to bring to you uh, a subject that I find uh, both urgent and timely and important for us all to have a clear grasp on. And before I begin to take it up to, uh, in this hour, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the great hymns of the faith and the great truths that we've had the privilege to sing, the great truth that our hope is in no other save in thee. Our faith is built upon thy promise free. As we come to this hour to consider this great subject of the relation of faith and obedience, especially as Calvin faithfully presented it in his writings and thought. We ask that you would help us and grant us understanding and draw near to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. When <clears throat> at the age of 50, I went back to school to pursue my PhD at Southern Seminary. Um, obviously, I did not want to take the eight or 10 years that some people take to do that. I was too old to think about doing it in that long a period of time. So I went uh, praying that God would lead me to a subject, especially for my dissertation, that would have uh, more usefulness uh, than simply to put a PhD behind my name that would actually be useful to Christ's church in a larger way than simply that. And so I was praying and over the uh, first few semesters there I was led uh, with really no forethought of my own 
to realize that the subject of justification by faith alone had again become a hot issue in, um, in evangelical circles uh, because of the influence on the one hand of the new perspective and other and a number of other influences affecting evangelicals which I concluded all of which were having a tendency to confuse and cause evangelicals to drift away from what justification sola fide had met in the Reformation itself. And so what I want to do in this hour uh, is give you a very popular and simple um, uh, version of the first chapter I wrote in my dissertation. If you want the complicated version, um, uh, Eddie's selling it out there. It's called Faith, Obedience, and Justification, Current Evangelicals, Departures from Sola Fide. And uh, let me just forewarn you, it's a doctoral dissertation. <laughs> so don't expect it to be easy going and don't think that I always write like that, okay? <laughs> but I want to take up in this hour uh, the, subject, uh, the subject of my first it's actually the third chapter in the dissertation, but it was my first chapter that I wrote and the foundational chapter for my thinking. And so I've simply entitled this Sola Fide, Faith Alone in Kelvin. Um, Kelvin frequently and explicitly, uh, this should come as no surprise to anybody, affirmed justification sola fide. But the great question he, that had to be asked of him and that he had to answer and that we have to answer today is, what did he and the Reformation mean by faith? There is a contemporary tendency, it's widespread, it infects at least to some extent many evangelical theologians to identify faith and obedience. Now you know what happens if you would identify faith and obedience? that it's equally true to say that we're justified by faith alone and justified by obedience alone. Or in other words, they define faith as at least including obedience to Christ, uh, sanctification, evangelical obedience. But now you know as well, and this is also a widespread tendency, there's a contemporary tendency to separate faith and obedience. I'm talking about easy believism as it's taught by the Free Grace Theological Society and uh, widespread and dispensational circles to separate faith and obedience and say that a person can have faith and live a life that manifests no basic obedience or principle of obedience to Christ and still call themselves a Christian. Now I hope to show that for Calvin and for the Reformation because I think Calvin simply uh, represents as the theologian of the Reformation, the Reformation view of justification sola fide, I hope to show that for Calvin, both tendencies are wrong. And we will ask then this question, here's the question that's going to occupy our attention this, in this hour, does justifying faith include evangelical obedience in the theology of John Calvin? <clears throat> That's the question we have to ask, but the answer uh, is not simple. To put the issue differently, for Calvin, is evangelical obedience included in justifying faith? Well, that's where we're going. Now, of course, you know that Calvin could not, could not avoid this issue uh, in asserting sola fide. He is Roman Catholic adversaries specifically argue that it was simply impossible to separate justifying faith and evangelical obedience. It's simply impossible to separate faith and the obedience flowing from love and born of the gospel of Christ. And so the whole idea of justification sola fide was nonsensical to Roman Catholics. And by the way, this is what I mean by evangelical obedience. I mean that obedience to the gospel leading to the moral renewal of the sinner, to a change in his actual lifestyle. Now for the Roman Catholics of his day, to speak of being justified by faith alone was, was meaningless or heretical. 
Faith always included love for God and the obedience to God that flows from it. And if it didn't include that, it wasn't saving faith. Now, here's my thesis. My thesis is that Calvin answered this question with both a yes and a no. Does saving faith include evangelical obedience? Calvin answered that question both affirmatively and negatively, depending how the question was understood. If the question meant, does justifying faith have the character of evangelical obedience? Or does justifying faith produce evangelical obedience? Then Calvin said yes, justifying faith includes evangelical obedience, if that's what you mean by the question. If, however, Calvin took the question to mean, why does faith justify? Or does faith justify as evangelical obedience? Or does faith justify in its character as evangelical obedience? Then Calvin answered that series of questions with an emphatic no. And that's, of course, where my emphasis is going to be. But I first of all want to be balanced and, um, and take up the affirmative answer before the negative. Calvin's answer, of course, you know, has therefore considerable contemporary significance. Those who separate faith and obedience and those who fail to distinguish them, if Calvin is right, and if my understanding of Calvin is right, have deviated from the theological balance of Calvin and the Reformation. Both have departed from what the Reformation originally meant by justification, sola fide. Justifying faith and evangelical obedience must, according to Calvin, be neither separated, a la Eva's easy believism, or identified a la the new perspective. Sola fide for Calvin involves a crucial distinction between justifying faith and evangelical obedience, but not a separation of the two things. We must neither identify or separate. For Calvin, we must distinguish. My emphasis is that Calvin distinguished justifying faith and evangelical obedience, but I'm going to begin by showing that he also saw them as inseparable. So here's the affirmative answer. Faith and evangelical obedience, in fact, in Calvin, are inseparable not in one but two senses, or not in one but two ways. Faith is evangelical obedience in its own nature, and faith produces evangelical obedience in a different sense. So let me talk about both those things. First of all, for Calvin, faith is obedience. Um, Romans 1.5 and also Romans 16, I think it's verse 26, uh, use the phrase, the obedience of faith. That little phrase, obedience of faith, kind of bookends the epistle to the Romans. And Calvin's interpretation of that phrase, obedience of faith, is interesting and shows that for Calvin, faith is obedience. Uh, the great question that uh, exegetes raise, of course, has to do, have to do with the genitive there of faith. What does that genitive mean? Does it refer to an obedience that springs from or results from faith? Or is the obedience of faith the obedience that consists in faith? Both are grammatical possibilities. But for Calvin, there is no doubt about what that phrase means. He affirms that the obedience of faith is the obedience that consists in faith. Faith is the obedience. It is the obedience of faith in that sense. I happen to think he's right, by the way. Um, on, on contextual grounds. But here's what he says. We must also notice here what faith is. The name of obedience is given to it, and for this reason, because the Lord calls us by his gospel. And we respond to his call by faith. 
Faith is properly that by which we obey the gospel. You see his idea. God calls us. We obey that call. How do we obey it? By faith. So faith is the obedience of the gospel. But Kelvin also could assert that uh, faith is inseparable from obedience in the sense that it gives birth to it inevitably and without exception. Here Kelvin's understanding of Galatians 5, 6, you remember, in Christ Jesus neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works through love. Well, uh, his comments on Galatians 5, 6 clarify his view at this point. In his comments, Calvin makes clear that faith is not to be separated from obedience in the sense of good works. Good works always accompany and follow faith. By the way, this was exactly Luther's doctrine as well. Galatians 5, 6 is a key text for Kelvin, uh, and uh, a text, of course, that was key partly because uh, his Roman Catholic adversaries were constantly uh, pressing it on him as contradicting his view of justification sola fide. They would say, don't you see, we're not justified by faith alone, we're, we're justified by faith working through love. Well, <clears throat> And Calvin not only comments on Galatians 5, 6 in his commentary on Galatians, but also in the Institutes. He has important statements in which he uh, references Galatians 5, 6. On the phrase, but faith working through love, he remarks, I think this is from his commentary, when they attempt to refute our doctrine that we are justified by faith alone, they take this line of argument. So he's talking about the Roman Catholics and how they respond based on Galatians 5, 6. If the faith which justifies us be that which worketh by love, then faith alone does not justify. That's what the Catholics said. And here's his answer. I answer, they do not comprehend their own silly talk. Still less do they comprehend our statements. It is not our doctrine that the faith which justifies is alone. We maintain that it is invariably accompanied by good works. Only we contend that faith alone is sufficient for justification. We refuse to admit that faith can be separated from the spirit of regeneration, a new life, but when the question comes to be in what manner we are justified, we then set aside all works. By the way, I think there's a direct connection between Calvin's comments in his commentary on Galatians 5, 6 and our confession of faith, the, uh, the whole Westminster complex of confessions, which, which basically says in chapter 11, that, um, I think it's chapter 11, that we are justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. Uh, I think that comes directly from Calvin, or at least ultimately from Calvin. So Calvin makes clear in many passages that faith is not contrary to nor the opposite of obedience. And this is, this is the place at which he is most contrary to the uh, easy believism that's prevailed, prevailed in evangelicalism uh, for the last century. For Calvin, from one viewpoint then, faith is itself obedience, and from another, it is the source of obedience and inseparable from it. Both of those things are true for Calvin. And so, uh, Calvin, when we ask, does faith include, does justifying faith include evangelical obedience? And from this standpoint, and from this understanding of the question, he says an emphatic yes, yes, in two ways. So Calvin's comments on Galatians 5, 6 are formative for later reform treatments. Oh, I'm going to say this. Look at the Westminster, and of course, the 1689 um, has identical language at this point. Faith thus receiving and resting on Christ and his righteousness is the alone instrument of justification. Yet it is not alone in the person justified, but is ever accompanied with all other saving graces, and is no dead faith, but worketh by love. Galatians 5, 6, and exactly what Calvin said about Galatians 5, 6. Now, what are the implications of the affirmative answer? Does saving faith include evangelical obedience? 
The answer from this perspective is that it surely does. Saving faith is obedience to the gospel. Saving faith produces obedience to the gospel. So in the strictest sense, it includes evangelical obedience. Calvin would have objected in the strongest terms possible to contemporary easy believism and its assertion that one can have faith and not live in basic obedience to Christ. Um. I mean, I might even have used that language we saw him use yesterday about dogs and swine, I think. But uh, I'm not saying we should. But nonetheless, I think he would have objected in strong terms to the whole concept of a faith that you can have that is devoid of producing obedience to Jesus Christ practically in your life. But faith is not simply equated with obedience in Calvin. And here we come to the negative answer. Faith is not simply, and without further ado, obedience in Calvin. There is another side to the matter. It's in one sense the most crucial uh, side for Calvin. <clears throat> the question, does justifying faith include evangelical obedience, can be understood in a different way. It can be understood this way. Does faith justify as obedience or are we justified by faith because faith is obedience and the beginning of new obedience is obedience the quality on the basis of which God justifies us by faith because God justifies by faith because faith obeys the law well that's the question and to those questions Calvin said an emphatic no Though faith is obedience for Kelvin, faith does not justify as obedience. I say, that seems like a fine distinction. Well, maybe it seems like that to you. But let me tell you, on this distinction, the Reformation rests. The whole defense of sola fide against Roman Catholic polemic resides in this distinction that I've tried to articulate by saying though faith is obedience for Kelvin, faith does not justify as obedience. <clears throat> so, I want to continue on here and take the rest of my time to show this negative answer to the question, does justifying faith include evangelical obedience? Let me give you an illustration which may help you understand uh, what's going on here and um, give you a window into the distinction that Calvin is making. Faith is like a fancy oval mirror, one of those fancy mirrors that you might find in a restaurant or uh, some other you know, nice public place where you would go. Uh, uh, that, fan that fancy oval mirror has more than one characteristic, you realize. It has at least two characteristics. It's oval. It's also reflective. True? Now, the point is this. The quality that makes this oval mirror a mirror is not that it's oval. It is oval. <laughs> but that's not what makes it a mirror. It's the fact that it's reflective that makes it a mirror. Okay? And this is exactly what Calvin is saying about faith. And so in that, that fancy mirror, we, call, we don't call it an oval. <laughs> we call it a mirror, right? Because that's what it essentially is. And this illustrates Calvin's view. Faith is obedience, but it is not this that makes it faith. Faith is obedience, but it's not that which makes it faith. It is rather the fact that it rests on Christ that makes it faith. Uh, this is, is the distinctive nature in the matter of justification. All right? The fact that it rests on Christ. It is obedience, and it produces obedience, but that's not what makes it faith. What makes it faith and what is its peculiar justifying quality is that it rests on Christ. And so, though there is an active 
character to faith, it obeys and it produces obedience. It is not the active character of faith that makes its faith. It is its passive character that makes it faith. The fact that it simply rests on Christ. Now let me unpack this a little bit more. Then we ask the question, the saving faith justify as obedience for Kelvin. And at this point, understood in this way, Kelvin gives an unqualifiedly negative answer to the question. And this negative answer will be argued in this lecture from three facets of Kelvin's theology. And by the way, I think these three facets of Kelvin's theology give us a window in the, to the entire Reformation and its doctrine of justification. I've seen it uttered by good men, who I think ought to have known better, that there was no monolithic doctrine of justification in the Reformation. Nonsense. There was one single doctrine of justification taught in the Reformation by all the major reformers and by all the major confessions of faith. And that doctrine of justification uh, carried with it and is reflected in three, the three statements uh, and the three ideas that I'm going to give you now that were common to the entire Reformation, to Luther, Calvin, and all the major Reformation confessions. And here they are. Uh, there was a common definition of justifying faith as passive. There was a distinction between justifying faith and evangelical obedience. And the entire Reformation made a dichotomy or a contrast between law and grace. Now, every one of those, those tenets is being denied widely in evangelical circles today which is why I think the doctrine of justification by faith alone needs to be carefully emphasized. So we're going to take up, first of all, the definition of justifying faith in Kelvin. I've added the words as passive, and I need to explain that word passive in a few minutes. First of all, what's the context of this definition? Kelvin begins Book 3 of the Institutes by stressing that it's the Holy Spirit that creates faith. Calvin is not in any doubt, as you know, that the Holy Spirit is the one that coming into our lives immediately creates that faith which unites us to Christ. He is the bond that unites us to Christ, and in another sense, the faith that he creates is the bond that unites us to Christ. And that's the way he begins book three. Calvin asks, all right, so we, we see, uh, this is common experience, some people believe the gospel and some people don't. The people that believe the gospel are saved, the people that don't are lost. All that doesn't change uh, and is not changed by sovereign grace. But the question that sovereign grace answers is deeper than that. Why do some believe and why do some not believe? So Calvin says we must climb higher and examine, if we're going to answer that question, into the secret energy of the Holy Spirit. And he says, and I think this is enormously important when we, we, we preach about regeneration and the new birth, that faith is the principal work of the Holy Spirit. Calvin has an ordo salutis that is built around sola fide. I just want to say, uh, your order of salutis, your order of salvation, your understanding of the application of salvation must also keep central the doctrine of sola fide. Kelvin has that kind of order of salutis. See, the fact that the Spirit is the source of faith sets the stage for his definition of faith by emphasizing that faith is the gift of the Father through the Son and in the Spirit's power. That's where faith comes from. That's a gift of God. And um, that kind of just creates the climate in which Calvin now comes to define faith. So it's true, I think Calvin would have said, that it is, it's by faith that we unite ourselves to Christ. But it's even more true that Christ unites us to himself by the Spirit who creates faith. 
Let's say something about the clarity of his definition. Calvin states his carefully crafted definition of faith in book three, paragraph seven, and he, he, he enlarges upon it for a number of the paragraphs around it, so it takes up a considerable amount of space in, in book three, uh, par, uh, paragraph seven, and throughout that section. And here's his definition of faith. Now we shall possess a right definition of faith if we call it a firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence toward us, founded upon the truth of the freely given promise in Christ, both revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Now what I'm asserting is that that is a passive definition of justifying faith. And let me tell you why. Uh, there's nothing not a word about obedience in that definition. Calvin does not define faith in terms of obedience. The central word in terms of which he defines faith, in fact, is knowledge. Faith is not doing something for Calvin, it's knowing something. That's really important to understand. This means that faith is passive because when you know something, you simply know it. You're not doing anything. That's what I mean by passive. And this knowledge is not the result of striving and a, and a vigorous effort to attain knowledge. No, in the definition that Calvin gives, it's the result of a divine activity. This is the, a knowledge of God's benevolence towards us based on the freely given promise in Christ both revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You see, uh, so there's an emphasis on the divine activity in making this promise known to us, not just in our minds, but known to our hearts. Now, the content of this knowledge also serves to underscore the passive character of faith. <clears throat> it is knowledge of what? Not of how hard we're working to please God, but of God's benevolence toward us. So Calvin's formal defini definition of faith seems to imply that the will is inactive in faith. And last night, some of you were uh, with the question of R.T. Kendall and his doctoral dissertation came up. And this is, this is kind of his getting off point in Kelvin because he looks at Kelvin's definition of faith and says, well, this is a definition of faith that's intellectual, that has to do with the mind. And the will is completely inactive. Now, <clears throat> I grant that that seems to be the case in Calvin's formal definition, but you can't read beyond and outside this formal definition of faith without realizing that it's simply not true that the will is, of man is completely inactive in faith. <coughs> Calvin elsewhere describes faith as involving a movement of the will, but even these descriptions which clearly involve a movement of the will as a part of faith, make clear that faith is passive in an important sense. Calvin says, in the near context of his formal definition of faith, that we will be saved if indeed with firm faith we embrace, that's a movement of the will, we embrace this mercy and rest, now granted, that's passive, but it's also an activity. You have to use your will to rest in it with steadfast hope. This then is true knowledge of Christ. If we receive, again, action of the will, him as he is offered by the Father, namely clothed with the gospel. So we, we cannot say that Calvin has an intellectualist definition of faith. Uh, that's the impression, yes, that his formal definition gives. But if you read anything else, you begin to realize that Calvin sees that the will of man has to be active in faith. But the, how is it active? It's active in embracing Christ, in resting on Christ, in receiving Christ. And those activities, don't you see, are in an important sense passive. Now, <clears throat> faith then is not a kind of obedience by which we save ourselves 
but it is resting on and embracing Christ to save us. Boy, that's important. Boy, a lot of people are, con are confused about that. Lost people, uh, because of our native proclivity to the covenant of works, <laughs> as the Puritans would have said, uh, even when you talk to them about faith, here you're talking about a kind of works. Faith is just a special kind of works by which we save ourselves. No, it's not! It is resting, receiving, and embracing Christ. And it's interesting that now uh, Calvin talks about this in a comment on Galatians 5, 6 that he makes in the Institutes. Uh, and again, he refers to his Roman Catholic opponents. Also, they pointedly strive after the foolish subtlety that we are justified by faith alone, which acts through love, so that righteousness depends on love. Indeed, we confess with Paul that no other faith justifies but faith working through love. So is that sort of right? There's no other kind of faith that justifies than the kind of faith that works through love, Calvin says. But, 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 it does not take its power to justify from that working of love. Indeed, it justifies in no other way, but in that it leads us into fellowship with the righteousness of Christ. You see what Calvin's saying here? The whole gospel depends on this distinction. Well, uh, Calvin comes in a very interesting comment to uh, give us even more clarity on this issue of the nature of faith. John 6, 29, you know it. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Kelvin comes in his commentary on John 6 to comment on this, and what he says is really, really interesting. Here's what he says. Um, it is idle sophistry under the pretext of this passage to maintain that we are justified by works. You can see the Roman Catholic, see, 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 faith is a work. Faith justifies by works. Calvin says, that's idle sophistry. Under the pretext of this passage, to maintain that we are justified by works, if faith justifies, because it is likewise called a work. See, it's a work. <laughs> you can just hear the Roman Catholic priest saying that. Well, Calvin says, no, that's sophistry. Now, faith brings nothing to God, but on the contrary, places man before God as empty and poor that he may be filled with Christ and with his grace. It is therefore, if we may be allowed the expression, a passive work. <laughs> I love that. What's faith? It's a passive work. Well, that seems kind of paradoxical, but that paradox says it all. Faith is a passive work to which no reward can be paid, and it bestows on man no other righteousness than that which he receives from Christ. So faith is a work, but it's a passive work, says Calvin. It isn't a work for which is uh, uh, rewarded in its own right. It's, it's, it's a work that leads us to Christ and gives us the righteousness of Christ. And it's on that basis that we are rewarded. Now, I wish R.D. Kendall had, written, had read this and a lot of other people because it shows just how wrong his thesis is that faith is simply an intellectual uh, idea, an intellectual conviction that we're saved, which is what Kendall says. It's nonsense. Um, there's this whole other side uh, to Calvin's doctrine of faith, which does not change the fact that it is fundamentally passive because faith is fundamentally in its justifying quality, resting on Christ, embracing Christ, and receiving Christ. But it's not a merely mere intellectual conviction that we're born again. That, by the way, is not faith at all. It's presumption, perhaps. At best, it's how we ought to define assurance of salvation, but it's not how we ought to define faith. Faith is a passive work, 
the will of man is involved in faith. The will of man is doing something. It's embracing Christ. It's receiving Christ. It's resting on Christ. But all these things that the will of man is doing are passive things, right? So passive work epitomizes Calvin's view of faith. Faith is a work, it's a human activity, but it is passive, presenting man before God as empty and poor, that he may be filled with Christ. Here's Calvin's version of, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, right? Here's our conclusion. Calvin says nothing about faith as obedience in his classic descriptions of justifying faith. There's nothing about faith being obedience. There's everything about faith leading us to the righteousness of Christ and resting on Christ and receiving Christ and knowing God's benevolence toward us in Christ, but there's nothing about obedience in any of his definitions of faith. A lot of modern evangelicals should listen to this really carefully. The fact that faith is obedience is not the important, peculiar, or justifying power of faith. It justifies only in that it leads us into fellowship with the righteousness of Christ. For Calvin, saving faith does not justify as obedience. In this sense of the question, does saving faith include evangelical obedience and the theology of John Calvin, the answer is no. But here's the second window into the Reformation's doctrine of justification by faith alone that we have to understand. We have to understand not only a passive definition of justifying faith, not passive in the sense that the will never moves, but passive in the sense of what the will actually does, but we also have to understand that the Reformation's doctrine of justification is, is built upon and assumes a distinction between justifying faith and evangelical obedience. The relationship between justifying faith and evangelical obedience in Calvin's writings also points to a negative answer to the question, does justifying faith include evangelical obedience? Calvin describes evangelical or obedience or the moral renewal of one's life in book three of the Institutes with three words. Now you have to understand this if you're gonna understand the quotations from Calvin I'm gonna show you. He, he describes it as sanctification. Now we understand that word. But the other two ways in which he describes this moral renewal that comes out of faith, uh, are, are, he uses words that are kind of confusing. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying to fully defend his use of these words, but you just have to understand how Calvin is using them and what he means by them. He describes this moral renewal of our lifestyle that comes by justifying faith as repentance. He does not mean by repentance here the, the turning of the soul in man that accompanies saving faith and initiates salvation. He means an ongoing life of repentance in which we're constantly turning from sin and turning to God. That's what he means by repentance in Book 3 of the Institutes. <clears throat> the other one is even more confusing and difficult for us Calvinists because he also uh, uses the term regeneration to talk not about the initial, initial new birth, but about the ongoing renewal of our lives and hearts through the gospel. And this is the way he uses the term regeneration. <clears throat> now, if you're listening closely, you know you're gonna, you're gonna hear me say that Calvin believed that regeneration followed faith. shocking. Now, in other places, I'm not going to take the time to show you them today, Calvin admitted that regeneration could refer to the work of the Holy Spirit by which he gives us faith. But massively and dominantly in book three of the Institutes and other places, Calvin uses regeneration to refer to sanctification and the sanctification which results from faith. And by the way, you should know that in the Reformed tradition, the whole order of faith and regeneration is a matter of some controversy. Um, 
And I'll give you one further hint. This is why when, I, when, I, uh, when I'm teaching the doctrine of salvation, which I have to be doing right now uh, to, at the Midwest Center, I don't take regeneration as the major category, category to talk about the idea of God giving us faith. I, I take the, the term effectual, the phrase effectual calling, because that, that uh, is actually what the confession does. The confession has no chapter on regeneration. It does have a chapter on effectual calling. And so all I'm saying here is that uh, the problem in Calvin and, and his other uh, stalwarts of the Reformed tradition is what they meant by regeneration. And this is why the order of faith and regeneration was somewhat controversial. Does regeneration refer to that re renewed lifestyle that flows out of justification by faith? In that sense, regeneration follows faith, if you use the word that way. Uh, or does regeneration refer to what we call the new birth and what John 3, 3 and 5 are talking about when it says you can't see or enter the kingdom of God without being born again? Well, you see, the, the controversy is about how you define regeneration. All right, all that's free. Uh, I, I'm, just, I'm going to get out of it now. But you just have to understand that when, in the quotations I'm going to show you in Book 3 of the Institutes, Calvin is using both repentance and regeneration as synonymous with ongoing sanctification. Okay? He maintains that faith in Christ precedes and is the means of this evangelical obedience, which he variously describes as repentance, sanctification, or regeneration. And... Uh, I'm going to show you now what I think the structure of Calvin's order of salvation is. And I can't, I can't take the time to prove this to you, but I think this diagram gives you substantially what Calvin teaches in Book 3 of the Institutes. Here it is. This is Calvin's view of the application of salvation. And I think it comes out pretty clearly in his... Uh, in book three, and I think, by the way, it's really, really important, and I think Calvin is really, really uh, much more biblical in his approach than a lot of other treatments of the order salutis, okay? Uh, so how does the salvation get applied to us? Well, first of all, you have the Holy Spirit who creates faith. That's where Calvin began. As salvation begins with the Holy Spirit and the sovereign work of God creating faith in Jesus Christ. When we have faith in Jesus Christ, we're, of course, united with Christ. And so Calvin's Ordo Salutis keeps sola fide central, and it also keeps union with Christ central because uh, all the benefits, all the salvation that God has for us is found in Jesus Christ. It's all there, and that what needs to happen is that we need to get into Jesus Christ. And that happens by the Holy Spirit creating faith in Christ. And once we're in Christ, we have all these benefits simultaneously. Uh, and Calvin says there are substantially two benefits. Of course, we know that you could enlarge on this a great deal. We could talk, Calvin doesn't deal with adoption and so forth. But uh, I do think in principle he covers the basis in a pretty good way because he says there, there are two great blessings that we receive uh, through faith in Jesus Christ and in union with Jesus Christ. We receive justification a new legal status before God. That's what he means by justification. And justification has really two parts for Calvin. or uh, uh, You can look at it in two ways. It's forgiveness of sins and it's acceptance with God. Justification is not moral renewal for Calvin. Justification is forensic. Justification has to do with our legal status before God. But Calvin says at the same time that sola fide and, fa and union with Christ gives us a justification, a new legal status of righteousness with God, it also gives us sanctification. And by sanctification, he, me he means uh, the renewal of our lifestyle. Justification is once for all, but sanctification is ongoing and includes uh, killing sin and new virtues. Killing sin and working on new virtues that replace that sin that we're killing. All right? Um, 
I just think that's a really, really important understanding of the application of salvation, which uh, if you looked at and thought about long enough, you could probably preach a 52-part sermon on or something. I don't know, 52-part series. I, think, I just really think it's important to look at salvation the way Calvin does here. He keeps union with Christ central. He, it's, it's monergistic. It, it keeps sola fide in the central place it should be. So much that's really, really good about this development of salvation, by, the application of salvation by Calvin. But uh, I must come to the point I want to make. Do you see um, where... Pointed here. Uh, you see where sola fide is? Sola fide is here. We're, we, are ju- we are united with Christ uh, by faith in Christ. That gives us justification. And out of this whole complex of events, faith, the Holy Spirit creating faith in Christ, uniting us with Christ and all his redemptive benefits, justifying us, the result of sola fide is sanctification. The result of faith is evangelical obedience. So you see, in, in, in this order of salvation, there's a very clear distinction maintained between evangelical obedience or sanctification and sola fide. You see that. It's really clear. Oh, faith in Christ unites us with Christ, gives us justification, and then our lifestyles are renewed. There's sanctification. Now, in, in, in thinking about it that way, Carl Kelvin clearly distinguishes between justifying faith and evangelical obedience, right? <clears throat> so faith is on to union with Christ, while well, sanctification is the result of union with Christ. And this this distinguishes clearly between justifying faith and evangelical obedience. Here's, Here's, I'm going to give you at least one quotation from Calvin. Pardon its length. Even though we have taught in part how faith possesses Christ, and how through it we enjoy his benefits, this still would remain obscure if we did not add an explanation of the effects we feel. With good reason, the sum of the gospel is held to consist in repentance and forgiveness of sins. Now here, he's using the term repentance as equivalent to sanctification. You have to understand that, and I'll become clear. Any discussion of faith that omitted these topics would be barren and mutilated and well nigh useless. Now both repentance and forgiveness of sins, that is newness of life and free reconciliation, are conferred on us by Christ, and both are obtained by us through faith. How do we get forgiveness of sins? By faith. How do we get repentance in the sense of the moral renewal of the way we live? We get it by faith. See the distinction Calvin's making here? He goes on. Now it ought to be a fact beyond controversy that repentance not only constantly follows faith. Now this is one of those places where I want to qualify Calvin. Um, And if I were doing this myself, I wouldn't use the word repentance the way he's using it. But you just have to remember what he means by repentance. He means ongoing sanctification. Now it ought to be a fact beyond controversy that repentance not only constantly follows faith, but is born of faith. For since pardon and forgiveness are offered through the preaching of the gospel in order that the sinner freed from the tyranny of sin, the yoke of sin, and the miserable bondage of vices may cross over into the kingdom of God, surely no one can embrace the grace of the gospel without betaking himself from the errors of his past life into the right way and applying his whole effort to, notice how he talks about it, the practice of repentance. See, evangelical obedience for Calvin is the practice of repentance. It's ongoing repentance. And he says, no one can really embrace Christ without at the same time getting into the pathway of the ongoing practice of repentance. You have to, you're going to be characterized by ongoing repentance if you ever believe in Christ. That's the result. So much for easy believism. So what Calvin variously calls repentance, sanctification, or regeneration is what I'm calling evangelical obedience. And Calvin sees an inseparable connection between this evangelical obedience and justifying faith. Faith in Christ creates union with Christ, which has for one of its benefits evangelical obedience. 
The connection is clear and the distinction could not be plainer. So to be precise, it is not as obedience that faith justifies. Justifying faith precedes and enables evangelical obedience. See that? It's really, really clear in Calvin's whole development of the application of salvation. All right, well that brings us to the third window on the Reformation's doctrine of justification sola fide. <clears throat> How am I doing? Well, I was short yesterday, right? So I, I'm, I'm going to be a little longer today. You, you, I, 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 this is payback. <laughs> The third window into the Reformation's doctrine of justification sola fide, and which is clear in Calvin, is the dichotomy between law and grace. <clears throat> the contrast or dichotomy, uh, I'm using the word synonymously, between law and grace is to be found in Calvin. Faith is response not to the law, but to grace. Now, there's this horrible tendency. Uh, in, in a lot of so-called evangelicals to say that there's no distinction or dichotomy or contrast between law and gospel. But if you deny the contrast between law and gospel, you are denying the Reformation's doctrine of sola fide because the Reformation's doctrine of sola fide is built on a contrast between law and grace. Calvin asserts that faith is founded upon the truth of the freely given promise in Christ. This is his definition, remember? Now we shall possess a right definition of faith if we call it a firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence toward us, founded upon the truth of the freely given promise in Christ. The freely given promise in Christ. Those are the words. Faith is founded on the freely given promise in Christ. It's not founded on the law. This statement alludes to an important distinction Paul makes between the law and the gospel. Calvin begins his treatment of faith in book three of the Institutes by contrasting law and grace. Secondly, it's not only hard, but above our strength and beyond our abilities to fulfill the law to the letter. Thus, if we look to ourselves only and ponder what condition we, would, we deserve, no trace of good hope will remain. But cast away by God, we shall lie under eternal death. Thirdly, it has been explained that there is but one means of liberation that can rescue us from such miserable calamity, the appearance of Christ the Redeemer, through whose hand the Heavenly Father, pitying us out of his infinite goodness and mercy, will to help us, if indeed with firm faith we embrace this mercy and rest in it with steadfast hope. See the contrast between law and grace there, it's really clear. And it becomes clear as well, uh, in his contrast between the promises of the law and the promises of the gospel. Now to be sure, the law itself has its own promises. Therefore, in the promises of the gospel, uh, there must be something distinct and different unless we would admit that the comparison is inept. But so what sort of difference will this be other than the gospel promises are free and dependent solely upon God's mercy, while the promises of the law depend upon the condition of works? You see the contrast between law and gospel here? It's crucial. The unique, peculiar, justifying quality or property of faith is not obedience to the law. Faith is a response to the gospel. Faith is obedience, but it is not as obedience to the law that it justifies. It is as obedience to the gospel and to grace as distinguished from law. Do I need to say that again? <laughs> uh, Faith is obedience, but it is not as obedience that it justifies, but as resting on the grace of Christ. Here, here are the words, very wise words of W. Stanford Reed. In his own day and ever since, those opposed to his doctrine have cited the terms of Galatians 5, 6. Faith working by love is showing that love plays a part in justification. While Calvin is prepared to recognize that faith does work by love, he also insists that it does not take its power to justify from that working of love. Indeed, it justifies by no other means than by leading us into fellowship with the righteousness of Christ. And then that faith is reckoned as righteousness solely where righteousness is given through a grace not owed. In his commentary on Galatians, he ends his exposition of this verse by pointing out that when he is speaking of justification, he sets aside all works.
So, conclusion. There are troubling tendencies today among people who profess to be part of the Reformation tradition to identify faith and obedience, to speak of being justified by faith working, to erase the contrast between law and grace, and to define justifying faith in terms of faithfulness. These are tendencies that are directly contra contrary to Calvin's and the Reformation's understanding of sola fide. These tendencies are contrary to the classic view of sola fide enunciated by Lutheran Calvin. I guess that's my last thing. And so here's what I want to say. If someone's going to say, and, and everybody has to say, you know, that they believe in justification by faith alone, to be honest and historically accurate, they need to mean what Luther and Calvin meant by that. But there are a whole lot of evangelicals around today saying they believe in justification by faith alone, but they actually mean by that something much more like what the Roman Catholics were saying in Calvin's day than what Calvin was saying. If you say you believe in sola fide, you're saying you believe in a passive definition of faith. If you say you believe in sola fide, you're saying you believe in a distinction between faith and evangelical obedience. If you say you believe in sola fide, you're saying you believe in a contrast or dichotomy between the law and the gospel. And these men deny every one of those tenets. And so when they say they believe justification sola fide, from an historical standpoint at least, they are misrepresenting their true position because their true position is much closer to that of Rome than to that of the Protestants in the 16th century. Well, I hope this is helpful to you. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to lay these things out carefully and with some care this morning. I pray that you would grant these dear men understanding and a clear understanding and grasp of the gospel of Jesus Christ and of justification sola fide through the great work of our father in the faith, John Calvin. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.